Sutra. For example, lutes, flutes, and guitars can make wonderful sounds, but if there are no skilled fingers to play them, their music will never come forth. Commentary. Although the treasury of the first common is empty, it is nonetheless replete with own dramas. For example, lutes, flutes, and guitars can make wonderful sounds. Various instruments can make subtle wonderful sounds, but if there are no skilled fingers to play them, their music will never come forth. No matter how fine the, the instrument is, there is no way it can play itself. There must be clever fingers to play it. Although the text speaks of skilled fingers, there must also be a skilled mind. The mind cannot control the fingers if it is not skilled. The skill in the fingers comes from a skilled mind, which is what brings forth the exquisite sounds. Sutra, Jude and you and all living beings are the same way. The precious, enlightened mind is perfect in everyone. Thus, I press my finger upon it, and the ocean impression in its light. You move your mind, and the very some defilements spring up. Commentary, the, the musical instrument that needs a musician before it can make music. The instrument may be fine, but what comes out may not sound so good if one is not a musician. Is an analogy for the treasury of the third common. The Buddha tells Purna, Jude and Jude, and all living beings are the same way. Withdraw ordinary thought. You try to make suppositions about the state of the first come one, and so you fit the analogy. The precious enlightened mind is perfect in everyone. Every person is complete with it. Thus, I press my finger upon it, and the ocean impression in this light. Here, the first come one refers to himself. All I need to do is press my finger, and the ocean impression in this light. What is the ocean impression? It is a kind of samadhi which the Buddha has where the mirror things are all known to the mind as if they had been imprinted on it like a seal. When the ocean is completely smooth, it can reflect the mirror things. It is what is meant by the ocean impression in this light. You move your mind and the, the wearisome defilements spring up. As soon as a thought comes to your mind, the tiresome dust arises. The false thinking mind manifests itself. The Buddha presses his finger and the ocean impression emits light, which shows how subtle and miraculous the state of the Buddha is. Purna and other living beings don't have such a subtle state. They exist in a state of wearisome defilements. Sutra, it is all because you do not diligently seek the unsurpassed enlightened way, but are fond of the lesser vehicle and are satisfied with little attainment. Commentary, here the Buddha scolds Purna even more severely. Why haven't you cut off your wearisome defilements? Why do you move your mind and let the tiresome dust spring up? It is all because you do not diligently seek the unsurpassed enlightened way. You aren't attentive at all times to the unsurpassed path to enlightenment, but are fond of the lesser vehicle and are satisfied with little attainment. You are greedy for the dramas of the small vehicle and are content with having attained a slight state. This section of text is very important. Everyone should take a look at himself Ask yourself whether you are actually diligently seeking on the past body. Are you genuinely seeking the Buddha Dharma? If you really want to understand the Buddha Dharma, you should diligently seek on the past body. Ask yourself what are you what you are doing here every day? Is it the case that I just follow the crowd? If people laugh, do I laugh? If people talk, do I talk? If you just follow the crowd, you are not really developing your own skill. If you are really working on yourself, then you aren't even aware of it. When someone beside you speaks, you don't even hear them. If someone walks past you, you don't even see them. 
I'm not deaf, I'm not blind, you say, why wouldn't I see them? Why wouldn't I hear someone speak? If you are able not to see and not to hear, even though you are not blind or deaf, that is wonderful. When you've really got something, you are not blind or deaf, but your eyes see forms, but inside, there is nothing. You just hear mundane sounds, but the mind does not know. If you can be like that, then I know that you are diligently seeking unsurpassed body. If you are not like that, you should be courageous. Truly set your mind on the way and seek the unsurpassed path. One day someone said to me, there is not a single place here that's quiet. If you yourself are quiet, then every place is quiet. If you yourself are not quiet, then no place will be quiet. If you are not quiet within and are turned around by external stairs, there will be external stairs wherever you go, no matter where you go, to the mountains, to the rivers, on the great earth, in the houses and cottages, on the porches and verandas. No matter where you go, it will not be quiet. It is because you can't even get along with yourself. You get angry with yourself. And why is that? because you can't control your environment. You are influenced by it. When someone passes by a person who diligently seeks for body, he doesn't notice the person passing. If someone says something nearby him, he doesn't even hear it. You are always urging the impossible. You protest, it can't be done. If you can find a way to do the impossible, then it counts. All of these things are insignificant steps if you have the way. If you can turn the noisy city into a mountain grove, you've got some skill. So ask yourself whether you are diligently seeking the unsurpassed body or have you come here just to find fault with people instead. So and so is alright, but so and so is always wrong. Do you just keep pointing the camera outward? to take pictures of others and never of yourself. You should return the light and look within. Have you really been studying during the time you have been studying the Buddha drama? If not, then you've wasted your time. If you have been seriously studying, ask yourself what advantages you have gained. If you haven't gained any, you should work even harder. Take, for example, your ability to recite the Suragama Mantra. How are you doing? Can you recite it from memory? After all, the Suragama Sutra was spoken on behalf of the Suragama Mantra. Without the Suragama Mantra, there would be, wouldn't even be a Suragama Sutra. So even if you don't understand the text on the Suragama Sutra, you pass if you can recite the Suragama Mantra from memory. But don't worry about it too much. You should still eat when it's time to eat and sleep when it's time to sleep. Don't get so concerned about not being able to recite the Surakama Mantra from memory. Then when it's time to eat, you can't get the food down. And when it's time to sleep, you have insomnia. If you get all bothered about it, you'll be even less able to learn the mantra. I said, you should look and yet not see, listen and yet not hear. But people are turned around by situations and cannot control them. You pay a lot of attention to the something when you first see it. But after a while, you forget about it and it ceases to exist for you. Take a clock as an example. The old ones used to go tick tock and then come. If you have such a clock. You might notice it's ticking at first, but after you got used to it, you wouldn't even hear it anymore. If you listen for it, it's still ticking, but if you pay no mind to it, it's as if it isn't there at all. This proves that if your mind is not attached to something, it doesn't exist. And that's what's meant by the IC forms, but inside there is nothing. The ears hear sounds, but the mind doesn't not know. So you join everyone here in meditation, but then complain that a certain person wiggles. The person beside you keeps moving, but don't put the blame on him. It's just that you don't have enough somebody power. If you did, then no matter how much 
the person next to you moved, you wouldn't even know it. How do you know that person is moving? Because you are moving, your mind is moving. That's a state. There are little states and big states, good states and bad states. All you have to do is know how to use the Buddha Dharma and none of them is any problem. But I can't use it now, you protest. If you can't use it, you have to think a way, think of a way to do so. You have to keep heading in that direction. As your skill deepens, you will quite naturally not be moved by states. Once you have enough samadhi, no state will move your mind. In China, there's a saying, when you have studied in depth, you won't have a temper. People fly off the handle when they lack a sufficient education. If your samadhi is sufficient, then even if something is really bad, you can influence it for the better. For example, I've said that as long as uh, I am in San Francisco, the earth will not quake. People who don't understand the Buddha Dharma think that this is impossible. If but if you understand the Buddha Dharma and if you practice until you have some samadhi, then wherever you are, the earth stays put. It's absolutely certain that there won't be a problem. So now we are all studying samadhi power and when you really have samadhi power, it will be peaceful wherever you go. If you don't have any samadhi, then even peaceful places won't be peaceful because your mind is moving. With samadhi power, you can transform your environment. This is most important. Therefore, you must first study the Suragama Mantra and then you must study the Suragama Samadhi. With the Suragama Samadhi, you are not afraid of anything. You are really solid. So now, I'm telling the earth here in San Francisco to remain solid and even if an atom bomb fell, it wouldn't matter, it wouldn't go off. You should all have faith and not be afraid. With the Suragama Mantra and with the fact that we are explaining the Suragama Sutra, there is nothing to be afraid of. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are certainly protecting us as we study the Buddha Dharma here, so none of you should worry. Sutra, Purna said, I am non dual and complete with the first common's perfect brightness of the precious enlightenment, the true wonder of the pure mind. But long ago I was victimized by false thoughts that have no beginning and I have long endured the turning wheel of rebirth. Now I have attained the sagely behind goal, but it is not yet ultimate. The world honored one has completely extinguished all falseness and obtained wonderful true eternity. Commentary Having heard the Buddha say that Purna did not diligently seek unsurpassed body, was greedy for the dramas for the lesser vehicle, and was satisfied with a little, Purna responded. I am non dual and complete with the first common's perfect brightness of the precious enlightenment. He said that he and the Buddha were both replete with the nature of the treasury of the first common, the true wonder of the pure mind. There is no division into two, and it's not that there is more or less of anything. But although the Buddha's true, wonderful, pure mind and mind each has the precious enlightenment and is perfectly bright. Long ago I was victimized by false thoughts that have no beginning and have long endured the turning wheel of rebirth. In the past I got caught up in beginningless false thoughts and forever so long I have been turning over and over again in the six paths of rebirth. Now I have attained the sagely vehicle. Now I have been certified as having attained the fourth fruition of Ahashiv. But it is not yet ultimate, but I haven't yet gotten completely rid of my leftover, leftover habits of false thinking. My true mind has not yet revealed itself. The world honored one has completely extinguished all falseness and obtained wonderful true eternity. 
before the world or not one, the false is gone and only the true remains. His state is a particularly subtle, wonderful and true eternal. eternal. It will never change. Sutra I venture to ask the first one why all living beings exist in falseness and conceal their own wonderful brightness so that they keep drowning in this deluge. Commentary I venture to ask the first one. I dare to question the Buddha why all living beings exist in falseness. Why do they suddenly give rise to falseness? This is like Pana's earlier question. If the fundamental purity pervades the Dharma realm, why do there suddenly arise the mountains, the rivers, and the great earth? Living being self-nature is basically pure and devoid of falseness. Why then does the falseness arise? And why do they conceal their own wonderful brightness so that they keep drowning in this deluge? They cover over their wonderfully bright true mind and they go on in this world turning through the paths of rebirth until they are submerged in this world, just like being drowned. They keep sinking into the mire of the wheel of birth and death. Sutra, the Buddha said to Purna, Although you have cast off doubts, you still have not ended residual delusions. I will now employ a worldly event in questioning you. Commentary. Pana wanted to know why false thinking should arise in the fundamental purity which pervades the Dharma realm. False thinking which covers over the wonderful bright mind of everyone. In reply, the Buddha said to Pana, Although you have cast off doubts, you still have not ended residual delusions. When I explained the continuity of the world, the continuity of living beings, and the continuity of karmic retribution to you. You got rid of your doubts, but you still haven't completely realized the principle and are not yet totally clear. You still have a few questions. I will now employ a worldly event in questioning you. It will be easy for you to understand an ordinary event, a worldly phenomenon, so I will employ one in asking you some questions. Sutra, have you not heard of Yadnadatta in Shravasti, who on impulse one morning held a mirror to his face and fell in love with the head in the mirror? He gazed at the eyes and eyebrows, but got angry because he could not see his own face. He decided he must be a Lime ghost. Having lost all his bearings, he ran madly out. What do you think? Why did this person set out on a mad chase for no reason? Puna said, that person was insane. There's no other reason. Commentary. Puna, have, haven't you heard this story? Have you not heard of Yadnadatta in Sravasti, who on impulse one morning held a mirror to his face? Didn't you hear the news about Yadnadatta in the city? A flourishing virtue. At that time, there were no newspapers. Word just got around. Janna Dada's name means arrived in temple, Tsuchia, because once his mother went to a god's temple to pray and gave birth to her son while he was, she was there. One morning, Janna Dada got up and impulsively, without any forethought, picked up a mirror and held it to his face. His own face was reflected in the mirror, and he loved what he saw. He was delighted with how handsome the head in the mirror was. He fell in love with the head in the mirror. He gazed at the eyes and eyebrows. He scrutinized the features and decided the head was superb, but got angry because he could not see his own face. Then suddenly he flew into a rage. Why don't I have a head? He demanded. Imagine how fun it would be if I had a head like that. He got exasperated because he couldn't see his own face and thought he didn't have a head. I can see the head in the mirror perfectly well. 
like, why can't I see my own face and eyes? He decided he must uh, must be a remake ghost. At this point, he made a mistake. He thought he was a ghost or a weird creature of some kind. Remake ghosts would drown in the mountains and they have a kind of bewitching power. Remake and Wang Liang are two kinds of ghosts. There's a verse in Chinese about them. Loose floors, balloon guitars, eight great kings. Every king on top, Li Mei, Wang Liang, four small ghosts, each ghost to the side. Once he had decided he was a ghost, he lost all his bearings. He ran madly out. He was trying to shake the ghost. He ran up and down the streets of the city. There wasn't any other reason for his behavior except that he had become possessed with the idea that he was a ghost. What do you think, Perna? What's your idea about this? Why did this person set out on a mad trace for no reason? What was actually behind the unreasonable behavior that led him to run madly about? Perna said that person was insane. There's no other reason. Yanadatsa went crazy. He had no sane motive he didn't understand and therefore he said he must be a weird creature because he couldn't see his own head. Now it is true that he didn't have a head. I believe that all of you are more intelligent than Yanadatta and that none of you would, be, would conclude that you didn't have a head just because you saw a head in a mirror. Basically, he hadn't lost his head but he thought he had. Puna had asked Shakyamuni Buddha why the living beings give rise to falseness for no reason. Shakyamuni Buddha then brought up Yanadatta and asked why he had decided on impulse that he didn't have a head. Puna replied that Yanadatta's mind had gone mad. Why do the living beings give rise to falseness? It's just because they give rise to falseness in the true mind. It's certainly not that fundamentally there is a root of falseness there which can produce a falseness. The principle is the same as with the case of Yanadatta. Sutra, the Buddha said, What reason can you give for calling false the wonderful, enlightened, bright perfection, the fundamentally perfect, bright wonder? If there is a reason, then how can you say it is false? Commentary, the Buddha said to Perna, What reason can you give for calling false the wonderful, enlightened, bright perfection, the fundamentally perfect, bright wonder? The Buddha is referring to the nature of the treasury of the first come one, which is still and yet constantly illumining, illumining and yet constantly still. It is subtle, wonderful, and inconceivable. What reason, the Buddha asked Bona, can you have for saying that the nature of the treasury of the first come one is empty and false? If there is a reason, if there's some basis for it, if it is a critical judgment, if there's some good reason behind your doing so, how can you say it is false? If you can pass a critical judgment about something, it must exist. You, it would be true, not false, and you wouldn't be able to say it was empty and false. Sutra, all your own, own false thinking becomes in turn the cause for more. From confusion, you accumulate confusion through compa after compa. Although the Buddha is aware of it, he cannot counteract it. Commentary on your own false thinking. Although it is false, gives rise to a lot more falseness. False thoughts are like ants in a short amount of time, a few can produce many. Or like bacteria, how does this happen? It has, I've said before, the good get together, the bad gang up, people find their own kind. In the same way, false thoughts arise, accumulate, and becomes in turn the cause for more. Suddenly, there's a lot of false thinking, in fact, that is what keeps people from becoming enlightened. If it isn't one false thought coming in, it's another one arriving. They flock in and out like guests 
at an open house, I asked one of you what you thought about in meditation, and the answer was, sometimes I think about good things to eat, sometimes uh, about wearing nice clothes, or about living in a fine house, or buy a new car. Sometimes I even plan, plan how I'm going to buy a helicopter when I get the money. When you sit in meditation, all these thoughts arise. One goes by and the next one arrives. Coming and going all your own false thinking. From confusion, you accumulate confusion. One instance of confusion breathes a lot more through compa after compa. Because your false thinking is so great, you can't put a stop to it, and so you keep your self-nature busy from morning to night. Basically, the self-nature is fundamentally pure and pervades the Dharma realm. But when it entertains too much false thinking, it can't rest. It entertains false thinking for compa after compa and is never finished. Today, this false thought invited me over and tomorrow I've been asked by that false thought to go to a play. The day after tomorrow, I've got a date with another false thought to go dancing and then there are meetings and social gatherings. In general, there are a lot of things happening and for, so for compa after compa, from time without beginning until today, you still haven't finished having meetings. Although the Buddha is aware of it, he cannot counteract it. The Buddha sees all this going on, but he can't counteract it. He can't get you to turn around and face the other way. You are still friends with the false thoughts and can't renounce them. If you can't renounce death, you can't change life. If you can't reject the false, you won't succeed with the truth. Does renouncing death mean that I die now? And does changing life mean I go off to a new rebirth? You ask. No, it means that while you are still alive, you look up on yourself as a living dead person. If you do that, then you won't flat up if someone criticizes you or gloat with someone compliments you. Just pretend you are dead. Don't be so worried about your reputation and don't put a lot of energy into this thin shell of physical existence. Renounce death in that way and then after such a big death, you can have a big life. If you can't reject the false, you won't succeed with the true. Why haven't you attained to your precious, perfectly enlightened nature? It's because you have too much false thinking and can't renounce it. And every day your mind that seeks advantage from situations grows. Once you start seeking advantage from situations, there's no point in hoping to accomplish the way. Most people put their energy into lifeless things. People who cultivate the way should apply their skills to living things. Lifeless things means your physical body, which keeps you hopping on its behalf. In the future, your body will certainly die. The living thing is our self-nature, which never dies. When your physical body dies, your self-nature does not die. It just moves to a new house.